And I feel that defines piano playing, good piano playing, the ability of sharing the music, of awakening the emotions that the piece has in itself uh, to the listeners. And that can not be accomplished, at least for me, with the pressure of I have to play in a certain way. If you say I have to play well, then you're halfway not halfway to the other side. Hey Piano family and a very happy new year to you. This is our first video of 2023 and it's a little bit different to my normal videos. This video is actually an interview with Luis Fernando Tapia. And I first came across Luis in a Facebook group about six months ago and he was just starting to document and share his experience of his upcoming move from his homeland of Ecuador across the Atlantic to Spain, where he had won by audition a place at a music conservatory to study piano at degree level. And what really got my attention about Luis's story was that he didn't play any piano before the age of 18. And now less than 10 years later, he's getting ready to make this monumental move to study piano at degree level. And we're so used to hearing of, you know, high level players starting their studies at the age of four or five. I thought how refreshing it is to hear somebody's story that isn't quite like that and how much can we learn from somebody whose experience has been really quite different so i hope you enjoy this interview what Luis has to say is really worth a listen and hopefully it'll provide us all with some inspiration and motivation for the coming year so why not grab a cup of tea sit back and enjoy so how are you I can understand it's, it's great to see you you're you're in spain yeah i'm in spain now uh i'm i'm doing great uh, i mean it's been a huge change in many aspects i think but so far uh, i'm doing great yeah i mean i mean it and in some ways i mean the culture must be quite similar i mean the language is the same are you finding a big differences surprising differences not at all actually um yeah we speak uh, latin america mo most of latin america and spain we speak the same language and the culture you can see a lot of the influence of the spanish culture i mean at least for me it's been like almost not moving at all because <laughs> people are quite similar although uh, there are some things that are obviously um different but it's not like if i would have moved to ireland i, I can i can say that yeah 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 well i mean that's great because you have so much else to worry about really without having to trying to figure out language and customs and everything else as well so Luis, you know you and i first crossed paths on on a facebook group where, where you had posted some of your your videos and talked about your your move from, you know, from Latin America, from, from one continent to another. And what caught my interest was the fact that you started piano so late in life. You know, when we come to, to start playing piano, most of us who begin as adults, we hear these stories of anybody who has reached any kind of skill level in piano started as a child. They started when they were five or six years old. But that's not your story, is it? Yours, yours is completely different. So tell me how you yeah. first came to piano and when you began. Okay, so my story, uh, it's actually a bit different because I first started learning piano when I was 18 years old. Um, I come from a musical family. My grandpa is a musician and he's a guitar player and singer. So my family was always uh, interested in me pursuing uh, music uh, as a hobby or as an activity most kids do, like taking piano lessons, learning uh, violin or such, but I was never interested in that. Uh, I did learn the guitar. I did uh, learn mostly rock music, which was something I was interested in, but uh, piano was never my instrument of choice. And classical music uh, was something that I discovered when I was 17 years old. Uh, before that, I was not interested at all <laughs> in Mozart or Beethoven. Yeah, so it all started. I I I I set this um, time when it when I was eighteen years old and I went to college. That was a time when I really started learning music and learning piano. So what was it when you were eighteen? You started college that suddenly made you decide you were interested in piano. Yeah, what what what, what happened was that I I was always interested in music. So I decided to study music education. That was the only thing I was allowed to study because uh, if you want to enroll in a undergraduate or bachelor degree in some instrument, you're required to already have some music skills, which I didn't. I, since I was interested in studying music, I enrolled in a music education program because uh, normally the other 
programs such as performance or composition require you to have uh, already some background and some skill level at the instrument or music theory. So I studied uh, music education and there I found my first piano teacher who was actually my classmate. <laughs> it's funny because he is a really accomplished musician. He's a composer, pianist, has performed uh, many countries, won many awards, but uh, he never studied music at a university. So he is the composer of the Symphony Orchestra of Ecuador, my, my country. And uh, he's... The, the orchestra required some degree, like because of paperwork, you know, and he had to study music education because of that. And then we met his classmates, but I immediately had uh, contact with him forming or listening to his compositions. And I was mesmerized by his skill level, by how he was able to communicate. And uh, I was just impressed. So I asked him to teach me. It was very naive from my side because, I, I mean, normally a musician of such a level would not be interested in teaching somebody who's barely having a background in music. But he agreed, and I first started to learn uh, music uh, theory and music composition. And then I realized, oh, if I want to become a composer, if I want to really understand music, I have to play an instrument and I feel, and I still think the same, that uh, piano is the best instrument for that, for understanding music and for being able to comprehend what's going on uh, at a deeper level. I've, I've heard it said that it's not a coincidence that most of the great composers were very proficient in piano uh, as their first instrument and most of them, um, very few of them would have had another instrument as their main instrument it was mostly piano for that exact reason that it's 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 an orchestra in itself isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's it, uh, they, they say, I, I heard once from Daniel Barenboim that um, he had an analogy saying like Every instrument is a color, but the piano, it's a blank wall. You have to paint the colors there. And I think that's true. It's piano is, has another nature from the other instruments. Not saying that the other instruments are not good or are, are worse. It's just a different way of understanding music. Starting from that very, you know, from scratch, really, having to learn everything. How, how did you... I mean, you must have picked it up very quickly. Did you have a way of practicing or did you develop skills in practicing very quickly that, that helped you to put the foundations in place so fast? I I think I should have done that, but it was not my case. <laughs> not at all. Uh, when I first started learning piano, I had zero, or uh, I had no clue of how to practice. So my first months or even first year, I think, were, or my first month, were not uh, methodical at all. I would just sit at the piano and read the music over over and over again. And I have one uh, one funny story because I was practicing at the symphony orchestra um, building, and uh, I was playing over and over again uh, a little piece by Couperin. And once the conductor of the symphony orchestra knocked on the door and say. Don't you know how to practice? You should practice part by part and not uh, constantly play the same piece over and over again. You should learn how to practice. And I was shocked. <laughs> and well, then I said like, okay, uh, I think it's important that I learn uh, how to practice and how to study music. Uh, so you couldn't exactly say that the, the conductor mentored you, but he gave you some great advice at the same time. <laughs> yeah, one of the best advice of my life, <laughs> although it was not intended to do. I, I, probably he was just, just wanting me to stop playing, but yeah. I mean, how did you feel in those days? I mean, you were, you were taking on such a big task, really, to try and get yourself up to speed on, on piano. I mean, was it difficult? I mean, did you have doubts that you could do it? <sighs> no, I didn't. And I I think that part of that was because I was too young and I was really naive. And uh, I, I believe that being naive is a great tool sometimes because if you're not aware of 
all the obstacles that you have to face, uh, sometimes you just go through them without noticing. And that was my case. I, I only I had only motiv motivation, you know. I had motivation to to learn, and uh, my my mindset was I will do it no matter what. I will start and I will catch up with my I don't know expectations, and I didn't realize how much far I was behind uh, the other people until later, in which the time it was in, in which was. It was too late. <laughs> I had already started, but I feel that this mindset of, you know, not thinking so much and just doing things was a great starting point for me. And you've mentioned that ingenuity and courage have been really important to your success when you were learning the piano. So can you talk a bit more about that? What, what do you mean by ingenuity? Yeah, it's this sense of uh, childlike... Um, dreaming or uh, wanting something you know when when we are when we're children we accomplish incredible tasks like learning how to speak learning how to walk learning how to read learning all the complex uh, concepts that were put uh, in were taught in schools without any clue because we're not thinking of implications of Oh my God! I have to learn how to walk. It's such a complex, requires such a complex uh, level of skills. We just do it because, of course, we're we're big. we wouldn't have the ability to think that much. So I think that as an adult, as, uh, uh, myself uh, having learned piano as an adult, I feel that this ingenuity uh, or this uh, naiveness, not in a bad way, but this mindset of not thinking so much about what I want to accomplish, how will I accomplish, what the world will think of me, just doing it was very important, was a key part of my progress. This alongside with the courage of saying, okay, I'm 18 and I'm seeing all these children play a thousand times better than me, and but I, I still want to do it, you know? These two elements of my mindset were crucial for doing what I did. And your first recital, or one of your first recitals, am I right in thinking that was televised? Yeah. How it was... did that happen? <laughs> how difficult must that have been? Tell me about yeah, how that it happened. Was, yeah, it was very funny because uh, since I was learning with my teacher, who is a, a composer at the symphony orchestra, uh, I get to play at one of the uh, recitals at the symphony orchestra hosted and it happened to be in uh, the parliament of my country the parliament of my country and the symphony orchestra had an agreement of doing recitals every month or so and i got to play in one of them which also happened to be my first recital which also happened to be televised <laughs> it's it's in YouTube now. It was. It was. It was really terrifying. I mean, you can see it. Uh, it there's some fire. videos. Yeah, I'm shaking, and uh, look, it was. Look at the video. I can't. I can't see you shaking. I'll have to look again. <laughs> but it's you know. It's I, I like, I've had that experience of having, you know doing nothing like that, but just playing for people and, and shaking like, like that. So, but you got through it. Did you have any? Uh, had you learned at that stage how to perform, or was it just go and do it? Yeah, it was just going to it. Uh, by that time, I have it was one and a half years since I started playing, and I had to play there. So it was I had no idea how to perform. I wasn't really performing, if you can see the videos. I was playing, I was doing what I could, and um, for me, it was this. Uh, I, I saw it back in the day, like this huge accomplishment that I have to do, this huge task, and. Almost like uh, it was uh, a battle with my own fears and anxiety and uh, the doubts I had and a way to prove myself that I was more than that. So I took it as a challenge and uh, it was hard. I remember uh, at the backstage before I was going to play, there was somebody announcing me and I could see the parliament and all the people there and the cameras and I had an interview 
uh, for the radio and for TV uh, minutes ago. And I was like, oh, oh my God, is it really me? Like all this, all this moment, it's just depending on me. So it was terrifying. But then I remember I saw Ray Chen, the violinist, talk about uh, stage fright and that he just stood one step before going to stage and count one, two, three, and then going into stage, knowing that he had the control, that he could step into the stage whenever he wanted. And I did that, and it calmed me a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> but it was not the end of the world, yeah. When I finished performing, I think that was an amazing experience, and I, I'm really grateful uh, with my teacher for facing, uh, making me face such a huge challenge from the beginning, because then I finished and I was like, hmm, okay, now I have to play uh, this place. Oh, it's not, it's not as, as bad because I know I already performed. I already made a lot of mistakes and nothing happened. So I started learning, ah, okay, it's not a big deal. Excellent. So you started at the top and you're working your way down. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we start going back up again. <laughs> so yeah. uh, you, you also you've also started around the same time you started playing chamber music, is that correct? So that that's a whole different experience and one that piano players often don't get because it's not such a social instrument, is it? So that must have been a great boost to your learning as well. Yeah, it is. Uh I had some uh, gigs with the uh, percussion ensembles and it was you know Easy piano music that I could play, but um, it was 2017. My, my first recital was 2016. So 2017, uh, my teacher told me to perform a violin and piano recital at a concert hall. And it was my real uh, first time playing chamber music. I played a Mozart sonata. I played a scherzo by Brahms and uh, other pieces I don't remember. <laughs> but... It was my first experience and it was completely different because I learned how important it is to listen when you're performing. When you're playing by yourself or for your uh, alone uh, solo piano music, you can rush, you can slow down, you can fail and uh, you can still pick up. But if you are uh, playing with somebody else, if you slow down, it will affect him. And if he rushes, it will affect you too. So you both have to be very aware, both of your playing and of what the other person is playing or the other people that are playing with you. So that's a completely different mindset that after that moment, I realized I should also have one playing for myself. It's one of the most difficult things to do, even even if you're not playing with somebody else, to actually listen to yourself as you're playing, because the brain just decides, okay, we don't need that. We're focusing on the notes and what our fingers are doing. It it shuts down our hearing, doesn't it? So it's a skill yeah. in itself to bring that back and really be actively listening as you're playing, even doubly so in chamber music. Yes, absolutely, and it also happens when you play for other uh, for others. Your brain gets into a different mindset and realizes, oh, I'm not at my home, uh, in my room playing just for myself, suddenly somebody listening and it feels different to perform. And once you expose yourself enough to this, you start being able to hear better what you're playing because you're not thinking of, okay, I'm playing for myself. You're playing for somebody who's like far away from you and you're listening to the music as if you were that, that person. And that also changes a lot the way you play. So, you know, but to build up the practice of performing, I mean, did you have a way of going about that? Did you play for friends? Did you record yourself? What? Well, how did you get used to playing for others? It was a long process for me because I had a stage fright at the beginning. Uh, but I was, when I was about to perform, like before the chamber music recital, I was playing a lot with my friend, my violinist friend. I was playing for my teacher, then I play playing for friends, always trying to expose myself to the feeling of performing a lot. 
and uh, along all these years I've gotten used to it and it's just an exercise that I feel it's important because I remember the first time I was when I was first starting to play I remember I was playing a uh, Bach few the piano alone and then a girl came and said like oh that's so amazing can you play it again and I was paralyzed by the fact of being heard and going from there really being paralyzed not being able to remember free notes to performing which I, what I'm doing now I, I just had a, an audition and I perform uh, Bach and uh, in two weeks I will perform chamber music and in three weeks I will perform Haydn and, and from going to the first part of what, what, where I was to now it was a process which took years and took many times to expose myself, play, feeling nervous, feeling anxious, uh, and suddenly building up all this skill. It's like, it's an ability that you can train, I feel. And, and it's I'm, I'm sure across all those performances and all those exposures, you did make lots of mistakes along the way. I'm, 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 I could bet money on it, but it, it stops being important, I suppose, as long as you can get the main message across. Would yes. you say that? Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I've also, part, important part for, for that is, um, it's been also to listen to other people, to great pianists, to people you admire, and suddenly you see them making mistakes. And you're like, oh, making mistakes is not a problem. The problem is how you, um, you approach them. Because I, I've seen my teacher, uh, I was turning page for, pages for him, and he was making some mistakes along. But he was recovering and making making them disappear like it was not not a big issue. And I was like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be, you know. Great musicians also make mistakes, but they go uh, go forward. They're they're not sticking with the mistakes. Like, oh no, I played a wrong note, and now I will ruin the music. It's not like that. <laughs> no, it's it's all. We should give ourselves permission to make mistakes, but just keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's a really absolutely. important message, isn't it? Your things, as you say, started to get serious, and and you talk about the um, the first serious piece of music, the most difficult piece of music you tackled was a Mendelssohn um, piece. So that that kind of changed your learning curve a bit, didn't it? That that brought you into a different level. Yes, a lot, a lot. Uh, my very first piece was a Scarlatti Sonata in uh, in D minor. Then I had two preludes and fugues by Bach, then uh, WC Arabesque uh, number one, and the Mozart Sonata number 10, which were, they were difficult music. Like, <laughs> it, it was really difficult. But once I had this Mendelssohn piece, which is the fantasy in F sharp minor opus 28, uh, everything changed because suddenly I was faced with all these pianistic technical tricks that I had to. Uh, master, and it seemed, seemed uh, impossible for me. Tackling those techniques, did you just tackle them through the music you were learning, or did you use exercises or, or different approaches to, to surmount them? I, I did it through the music. My my, teach, my my teacher had this style to make everything go through the music. Uh, I've never played an etude or by Cherny or one of those. Although I I feel that I, I lack them now. I would have I, I would like to have practiced them before. Uh, but that was what I what I had. You know that was my 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 I don't know school of piano. It was everything from the music. So all the challenges I had before, I had to learn how to tackle them through the music like maybe making making my own exercises or trying to discover how it feels like to play a passage in 10 different ways and then figuring out what's the best for me so that was my my process of learning difficult passages i mean because technique i suppose when it comes down to it it's, it's really just learning how to produce the sound that you want, isn't it? And, and experimenting with how you want your body and your fingers to produce a particular sound. For, for a lot of beginner pianists, this idea of, of technique is, is a, a huge, big mountain that we, we all have to climb. And it, it can be very difficult to, to see our way through because it seems like there's so many different technical aspects. But really, it's just piece by piece, isn't it? It's just figuring out how to make a piece sound good 
and then moving on to the next one and see what challenges that presents. Yeah, absolutely. You, you also compose, though, don't you? You've started composing. Yeah, I, I, as I told you, my my main uh, idea when I started with this journey was to become a composer. That was my dream. So uh, I did, and uh, with the same teacher, I, uh, I said he's given me everything I know so far. Uh, he made a composing workshop for two years, and I was part of it, and I ended up composing a, a series of eight piano pieces, eight tiny piano pieces called Eight Piano Scenes, and it was my love, first composition. The way, they're, they're fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, there's no better way to learn music theory, is there, than, than by actually sitting down and starting to compose. So you must be pretty good at absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I I get bored super easily. I get super easily bored. And for me, I, I, I believe that there were there was not other, no, no other way to learn music theory than to really uh, seeing how much I needed when, for writing the music I want to write. So uh, part of composing was I, I analyzed a lot of music. I analyzed symphonies by Beethoven. I analyzed uh, pieces by Brahms. I analyzed uh, uh, string quartets by Borodin, Schnittke, like Sternberg, a lot of music for many years at the time to be able to compose uh, a 10 minute <laughs> tiny music piece. And uh, seeing what all the master composers did and why it was important to learn it was something that also reflected greatly uh, as an improvement in my piano playing. So, yeah, it was, it's really how important does, to know music theory. To play, when you play your own pieces in public versus playing another composer's works in, in public, how, how does it feel? Is there a difference between playing your own and playing yeah. somebody else's? Yeah, it is. It, it doesn't feel different to learn them. But when I yes, uh, it's not like you you compose the music and suddenly you can play them. It it learning learning them it's the same as learning it, uh, others. But when I perform my music, I don't feel the pressure of oh this is Mozart, so you should play it this way. It's just purely enjoying for me. I, I prefer playing my music because I just enjoy it and I just share it with with everybody. Which I, I feel it's something that everybody should have, even though playing Mozart, Brahms, or whatever you're playing. The, the most important thing is just to share it. Yeah, I think if we can keep that in mind, it, it does take some of the pressure off as well. It's just a, an opportunity to share what we love. Uh, absolutely. With other people. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, do you find that you know, you're 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 in Spain, you're studying music, you've got a, a heavy timetable to keep up with, and I'm sure, and a lot of music to learn quite fast. How do you look after yourself? I mean, that must be very stressful. Yes, it it, it is, and um, I've I don't know how to answer that actually. I've uh, I've adapted to it, and uh, I think when you're committing to learning music at a serious level, when music becomes it becomes the core of who you are, of uh, what you are doing in, 
throughout your day, then it's important to evaluate and adjust your beliefs, your actions accordingly to you being a happy and a stable person while studying music. Because music will demand a lot from you. Music will demand a lot of time, a lot of uh, a lot of work, and sometimes a lot of rethinking, reprogramming your mind. Because we have ideas such as "I cannot perform in public" or "I cannot do." I am a shy person. Music will say, "Hey, you have to perform next week with this these people," and if you stick with these beliefs, you will be stressed and you will make uh, you will harm yourself and I, I certainly harmed myself by uh, facing all this pressure that uh, me, normal musicians uh, they suffer a lot from this too you can see uh, a lot of young violinists young pianists that are suffering a lot but it's because uh, you need to adapt and to see the world in a different way I think for playing just for the enjoyment of sharing instead of feeling the pressure of, oh, I have to perform this next week. And making everything more about music, less about yourself. And it's hard. It's been hard. This, this months that I've been here have uh, been filled with challenges and hard times uh, in which I had to adapt and say, hey, it's not that important that I play one wrong note. What's important is that I get the whole... Uh, idea of the piece because the ensemble with uh, which I am playing does not care if I play an F sharp instead of an F natural, but they care if I am able to go through the piece and give them the confidence that they require to play. So I think this reprogramming it's uh, it's been important for not uh, panicking, yeah. <laughs> which is something so it, it can easily like it, it can easily happen. Yeah, it sounds like your journey from from when you started to where you are now has been one of enormous growth in your in your character and in your your way of dealing with life. Yeah, absolutely. I started with eighteen, and I am now twenty seven. So it's been almost a decade, and uh, music has shaped my my life completely. I would be a completely different person if it was not for music. I would not be here, to yeah. <laughs> an example. But I've learned. Uh, the good things, the light, and the darkness that music can bring you to, and uh, acknowledge, uh, ac acknowledge, <laughs> being aware of that. Yeah, acknowledge. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> being aware of that, it's important because uh, there's a lot of negativity in the music world that it's not being portrayed. When, when you go through Instagram, for example, you see all these pianists playing amazingly, not making one single mistake. And then you, you go to your own piano and you feel like, oh, no, I cannot play it all. But I feel that's a negative mindset to have. But you should be aware that all these pianists, all these uh, musicians have trained for many years and they do make mistakes. They just don't, don't upload them. So dealing with this is also something that... I feel changes you as a person and it's good that if you can overcome it and just just enjoy music not having this pressure of playing perfectly or whatever just playing for enjoyment and so i mean besides the love of piano you and i have something else in common is that we both have adhd so i'm really curious to know how you have managed to overcome the obstacles because it does throw up obstacles to learning and to memory and to organization and all those things there. So how have you worked around your ADHD uh, to get to where you are? Mm, that, that's, uh, that's a very important question. <laughs> um, when I first started learning, I had no idea that I, I had ADHD. I mean, I was diagnosed as a kid, but I was never treated. So when I was 18, ADHD was not something that was around my mind. I was certainly struggling with that but i feel that music gave me the, the the way of coping with this in in the sense of the passion i had for it and since i desired it so much i kind of sorted all the odds and all the obstacles that i had to face in adhd 
I do have to say that I was never an organized person. Uh, I remember that I was never practicing every day. I, I, I every, every weekend I was uh, regretting that, oh, I didn't go to the practice room uh, Tuesday because I just overslept or I just played video games with whatsoever. I was never able to do that. And I was never a constant person who will, still I'm not today, Every day practicing 15 minutes of scales, uh, 15 minutes of side reading, 15 minutes of that. I, I cannot do that. I can simply not do that. Uh, at first, I was struggling with that and I was punishing myself because I'm not able to stick to a strict routine. But later, I found out that there's other ways that I can uh, deal with music. It, maybe one day I'm super motivated because, you know, ADHD, it's not an, an ability to focus, it's an, an ability to direct the, your attention in where you want it to be. So there are days in which I am so uh, into the piece I'm playing and then I use them. Uh, I know that it, tomorrow will not be like that. And I use this day and I may play 10 hours that day because I'm so uh, interested in that. Mm. And I know that maybe next day I'm feeling really lazy and I don't want to practice. And especially now that's the World Cup, sometimes I'm like, Oof, I want to watch the match. I don't want to practice Titan. So uh, I negotiate with myself and I'm like, okay, I will practice this simple piece while watching the World Cup. It's not ideal. I don't I don't recommend you to do two things at a time, but that's the way I'm, uh, I learned how to deal with, with having ADHD. That's important for people to know as well, because, you know, I, I often hear from particularly adult students, that they feel that they should be practicing in a certain way, a certain number of minutes of this, that and the other every day, and they feel guilty if they don't do it. But in fact, you know, as you're illustrating there, there are different ways of practicing and it's not a one size fits all. So you find what works for you. Um, yeah. And I wanted, I wanted to address that because, yeah, uh, there, there was a lot of guilt that I put uh, on me because of that. And now looking at the retrospective, it was useless. Uh, it's better to acknowledge that maybe you have ADHD, maybe you have family, maybe you have a, another uh, job and you cannot do this every day. And regretting or punishing yourself, feeling bad because you cannot practice scales every day will not improve your, your playing. It will, it will actually uh, harm your process. So it's okay. It, it's it's better than you don't regret that and you use the time as much as you can, as uh, as good as you can. Then if you regret, oh, I didn't practice scales that day, or I didn't do my fifteen minutes, uh, whatever. That that's not helping you at all. And that's part of the things I, I've realized that are different when you're an adult, uh, as versus when you're a kid, because you're aware of your time, you're aware of what you can give, and there's no point in trying to achieve something that you don't have time for. Yeah, that's really good advice. So, I mean, you got yourself into this world of music and you're working hard. And then suddenly, this I'm really interested in knowing how you suddenly decided, right, I'm going to Spain. <laughs> what uh, what <laughs> made that, help you make that decision? And what was that process like? Because that can't have been easy to 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 get into a, a Spanish university for, for, for starters. What was that process? Yeah, uh, I, I always wanted to study abroad because my country uh, does not have a good musical level. So I could have studied in the university or conservatory in Ecuador, but the level is far from what you see in Europe or in the United States, for example. So it was always my idea. And uh, before 2020, it was 2019, and uh, I was always postponing that, saying like, oh, I will do it next year. I will do it next year. I will try next year. I'm not ready yet. And I was finding myself in a unpleasant position. Uh, I was not happy about my playing. I was not happy about my, my work. I was basically just giving, uh, uh, giving up on my, on my dreams. And suddenly uh, the pandemic, uh, came and I was locked at home and I realized how, um, unpredictable life is and how many things can happen. And I said, okay, now I'm still young. Like I will try to, to get to, to study abroad because I, maybe tomorrow I will not be able to, maybe they will close the borders. Remember the first lockdown, it seemed like you will never be able to get out of your house even. 
Uh, so I said, I will go for it. And I started looking uh, out for options. And I found that Spain, for me, as a Spanish-speaking person, was good. Uh, it was a good place to go. So I started uh, researching what do I need? What repertoire do I need? And I discovered I already had it for years, you know. Uh, I could have done it before, but I was, wasn't... was I don't know. I needed this, the pandemic <laughs> to to really face me with reality. And uh, yeah, I found that Spain was a good place to go for me. And then I just started preparing everything, paperwork, auditions and such. What was the audition process? Did you have to go to Spain for that or were you able to do it online or... Yeah, I had to I had to travel to Spain. Uh, I applied to places in which I could do it online, but for the specific place I found that I really wanted to go to, I had to travel to Spain. So I came to Spain uh, in June, July of 2022 uh, to to audition in some schools here. And did that did that feel similar to performing in recitals before, or was it was it harder? Was it more pressured? Actually, I enjoyed it for me. When I came here, uh, I was already working on my performing uh, abilities or, or the stage fright and everything. So I came to Spain when when I went to the, audition, to the auditions with the mindset of, oh, I'm going on vacations and I will also perform for these people. You know, uh, I didn't want it to put the pressure of, oh, it's an audition a jury will come and see you. Uh, so I was just, okay, I will perform. That was my my mindset. So how would you define, um, I mean, because it brings it into focus, doesn't it? If you have to, you're, you're performing now to get into a, a course, so there's a lot riding on it. So what was your definition then of good playing? What kind of standard did you set for yourself and how did you go about making sure that you reached that standard? Uh, good. Uh, well, I have to say that the first time I auditioned, it was a video audition, for a music school, and I was so much pressured on good piano playing is playing everything clean, making no mistakes, playing at a fast tempo. Uh, and when I, uh, this, this video recording uh, I made was basically not good. I was so stiff, so tense, and everything sounded the same. It was not music at all, musical at all. So.
at all. So when I came here, my mindset was I will just sit and make uh, make music, just share the music with everybody and enjoy. And I feel that defines piano playing, good piano playing, the ability of sharing the music, of awakening the emotions that the piece has in itself uh, to the listeners. And that can not be accomplished, at least for me, with the pressure of I have to play in a certain way. If you say I have to play well, then you're halfway not halfway to the other side. If you sit down at the piano and say, okay, I will enjoy. No matter what happened, my goal is not to play every note uh, or all the passages. My goal is just to sit down and enjoy. No matter if I'm at my house or if I have traveled the other continent and I'm sitting uh, in front of a jury that defines if I, whether I will be able to play or, or to study or not to study. Which if you think of that, it was a very tense moment. It, carried a lot of pressure because if I failed, I would not be able to study. But what made me made me play well, actually I was like fourth in the audition. I was like the fourth best grade. It's just sitting there and, and enjoying and just sharing the music. And I if I made a mistake, there was no problem. I will just give all the music I want to give to whoever's listening. I feel that that defines good kind of playing. Good. And after you did that audition, did, did you feel optimistic or were you were you wondering, did I get a place or uh, wait long it, to find out? Yeah, yeah. I, I auditioned in two two music schools. So the first I had to wait long and I was uh, I was skeptic. But for the first music school I, I, I applied to, I came with the repertoire and I said like mm, that's not the not that's not the correct repertoire. We want three oh, no. complete pieces and I brought four part of the pieces and that from the very first moment i was like oh no i will not make it and one of the jury members said you will you you can do better next time so before 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 even playing so i i sat at the piano with the idea of if he said i will do better next time it's they will not accept me at all so i went out out of this audition with the mindset i will not get into the place which i did and i was i think the second best grade of the audition right that first place wow. <laughs> but i i did not i did not i i went out with the idea that i i screwed i screwed it up and the second place i auditioned uh i was confident that i did my best but the level of uh, of competition that you have there were lots of pianists that played 10 times better than me which i i thought you know they they are kids i was 26 they were 18 17 years old you know so I, I thought there's no no way they will pick me, uh, but maybe, I don't know, I, maybe I was lucky. So that was my, my mindset. Mm -hmm. But you, you got your place anyway. In, in what, what's the name of the university you're at? Yeah, it's a conservatory and it's called, uh, conserv uh, I don't know how to say it in English. It's the Conservatory of Badajoz. Uh, the conservatory, it's a, it's a government conservatory. And uh, Badajoz, it's the city in which I am now. So, yeah, yeah that's so Music what, Conservatory in Badajoz. What's life like as a student at a conservatory? I mean, it's, it must be very busy, for one thing. Yeah, it is. Um, it's nice because I am now, I, I get up and I have my, my lessons. Sometimes I have piano lessons for one hour, then I'm going to music history, then I'm going to harmony. I am learning how to play the harpsichord. I have improvisation, jazz. I have um, chamber music. And I always have things to do. I always have dates. So, for example, the 15th of December, I will play uh, with my chamber ensemble. And then the 22nd, I will play piano solo. And there are always workshops, master classes, people that come to the conservatory and uh, teach, I don't know, how to accompany singers how to uh, many, many things and yeah and it's busy but i love it because it's it's uh, basically being a musician 24 7 which was something i always wanted to do yeah you're living the dream yeah <laughs> fantastic and so i mean it must be feel very different to i mean you're, you're basically living as a professional musician now it's, it's your full-time life so how does that feel different from just doing music as a hobby 
as your family originally wanted you to just have music as an activity or a hobby to uh, on the side but now you're doing it you know full time how does that feel mm -hmm. uh, i feel like it's it's a different thing uh because of the amount of time you get to to put on music but I don't feel that it's uh, inherently different in the act of playing, because for me, the core of the music uh, of music making, it's sharing. I've said this a thousand times in this interview, but it's sharing emotions, sharing feelings, sharing uh, your inner world to others. So I don't feel that it's different if you're doing it as a pianist, uh, I don't know, part of it, than as somebody that's playing every night for two hours or for one hour. It's not different in the way of the instrument you have, of who you are as a person. Of course, the difference is like Horowitz put all his life to it and you have this amount of time. But I've seen, for example, amateur pianists, pianists that are performing uh, just for a hobby, convince me a lot more as a listener uh, move my my emotions more than a professional pianist that's playing eight hours a day. So for me, it's all about the relationship you have with music and the amount of time. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. For example, with my students, I always try them to put this emotional uh, context of the music first. Once we've discussed about fingering, about technique and everything, I just say, now it's your time to be an artist. Now it's your time to say what you want to say with this piece. No matter if 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 you are a teenager aspiring to be a conservatory student or professional pianist, or if you are somebody that has 30 minutes a day, it, for me, it's the same. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. You might have seen, uh, there's a TED talk by Benjamin Zander. I don't know if you've if seen that one where he, he demonstrates that idea of, of communicating through the music. And he plays um, a Chopin prelude and he plays it twice. And the first time he starts to play it, he stops halfway through and he tells the audience, basically, if your mind was wandering, you know, you're starting to think about what's for dinner tonight or what you need to do. That's not your fault. As a performer, I wasn't connecting with the music and then he plays it again then he's 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 this time he's really it means something to him he's he's visiting his emotions and it comes through the difference is really quite astounding so when you're playing yeah. do you you know when you're developing a piece of music that you're learning do you think about what it means to you or does it conjure up uh stories or particular scenes or conversations as you play do you latch on to that or is it just purely emotion uh, it's it's not purely motion. Also, purely motion does not make music. You have to know a lot before, like the notes. You have to know the context of the music. It's a classical music, a romantic piece. Uh, maybe it's a jazz uh, tune. So you have to have this ground, technical, historical uh, background before. And once you've mastered that, once you know the pieces, when you know the notes, you can just focus on emotion, but you, it, it's a mix between technical, uh, historical, all the knowledge you have, plus the emotion you have. And so, and you mentioned you have students, so are, are you teaching in Spain or or was that this before? Yeah, I, I was uh, I was teaching in Ecuador and uh, as of the pandemic, I got to move to online teaching. So I am now teaching online. I'm pretty new to Spain, so I still don't have students here, but I'm teaching online and uh, I'm also trying to build a community of people who may be interested in following my journey and uh, hearing about, I mean, things that I said here, like my experiences as an adult pianist, uh, how I got here, my life as a musician and all the tips and knowledge that I got to learn throughout my journey. Brilliant. I, I would imagine a lot of my listeners will also be interested in, in hearing what you have to say. So you, you make sure that you send me all your links to your, your different pages. And do you have a YouTube channel yet? Have you started that? Yeah, I've started that. I'm trying to learn how to edit. <laughs> I think that was hard harder for me than to learn how to play piano. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. faster, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, so yes, make sure you send me all your links and I'll, I'll include them beneath this this video and people can can find you there i will appreciate so, Luis, it greatly thank you thank you thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me
we'll stay in touch and I'm I'm really looking forward to to seeing your progress and starting to see some videos come out as well once you get the hang of the editing. <laughs> yeah, I will certainly. Thank you so much for giving me this phase and uh thank you for creating this wonderful community. I've seen your videos and everything you say is really great value to to an aspiring uh, music musician thank pianists. You. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll be in touch again soon. Uh, you take care. Have a good day. Thank you, too. You, too. Bye-bye. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. So there you have it. How inspiring was that? If you want to follow Luis on social media, I'm putting his links in the description below. Uh, he'd love the support and encouragement that I know that you can give him. And I'm sure we'll be hearing lots more from him along the way. And if you want to take your playing to the next level in 2023, why not check out my courses and workshops over at Lakela Music. You can buy them individually, or if you want access to them all, you can uh, join the membership for a very reasonable monthly fee. So I hope to see you there, but in the meantime, happy practicing.